So yeah, Jay on the beats. I expected to be everybody to be like, you know, I'm the only one. I'm fine. Um, so yeah, that's me, Javier. Uh, my Twitter, if you have any complaints. And um, I work at QuestDB. It's a time series database, open source database. And today I'm going to be speaking how we have a replication. I'm not going to be showing any source code. Uh, you can check on GitHub if you want. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be at one booth there, so also you can drop by the booth. But I'm going to talk about technical details. Uh, why we chose to have replication, how other databases do replication, how we are doing it, what's next in the future, like, you know, a few, a few details. I hope you enjoy them. And the first thing I want to mention is that I'm going to speak about how we are building replication in QuestDB. I don't think it's the right way for every other database. Maybe it's not even the right way for QuestDB, but uh, different databases have different requirements. And our use case, the use case for QuestDB, is when you have data which is either moving fast or you want to do analytics over slices of time. That's basically the idea. This will be a typical request from a potential user. Like, hey, I have uh, 400,000. This, this is a real ask, actually, from someone. I have 400,000 smart meters. We are tracking energy consumption. And each of them is sending a data point every five minutes. Doesn't sound like much one data point every five minutes, but when you have a lot of devices, you have 100 million rows in one day. Every database today can handle, can handle 100 million rows, but a week of data is already 700 million. Some databases start to struggle, ingesting data, indexing, querying, 700 million rows, and that's only a week of data. And the thing is, today it's very easy to get billions of data points. If you have just 500 different series, 500 devices, 500 users, 500 machines, 500 whatever, sending a data point every second. There are a lot of seconds in one month. I, I never stopped thinking of this before working at a time series database, but there is over a billion, like, you know, it, it, you send only like 500 points, like, you know, so you're very, very, very quickly to get a billion of data points, and that's the kind of challenge that time series databases solve. There are other time series databases, we are just another one, Probably the best one, because you know, I'm the only one here. The others can get their talk, but, but that's the thing. So time series databases, we optimize, Amazon also has some time series database, or, or so they say. So we optimize for fast ingestion. We give you life cycle policies, so what to do with the data as it gets old. Uh, we are designed to do analytics over chunk of time, and we often power real-time dashboards. That, that's the, the context. That, that's the last part I'm going to be speaking about, you know, how we do. Uh, an overview. So we are open source projects. We, are, we have Apache 2.0 license. We are fairly popular, not widely popular, but you know, fairly popular in time series, 150 contributors. The project has been around for 10 years. For the past five, there has been a commercial entity around. So there is an open source part of QuestDB and then someone trying to make money. I work for that part, for well, actually both. But you know, it's a, yeah, we are a small company, but with a larger community behind, that's basically the idea. And uh, before I tell you about replication, I'm going to show you what it looks like, right? what, what type of use cases we support. So quickly, quickly, hopefully, I can see a couple of things. So I should have here, uh, well, first thing first, this, for example. I know you cannot see much on this screen, sorry about that. Hopefully it will be okay. This is a demo machine, it's open to everyone, demoquestdb.io, and we have a demo data set. It has 1.6 billion rows, it's not much. 1.6 billion rows. I'm going to run a query to do an aggregation on one of the columns. And this query, I don't know how fast you expect a database to scan 1.6 billion rows and give you a, a result. In our case, we do this in about half a second, which is not, you know, it's, it's not too bad. So in half a second, we can scan 1.6 billion rows, give you an average, whatever. Uh, we power use cases like this one, this is a live dashboard on uh, the API from Bitcoin. So every quarter of a second, we are refreshing and getting data from you know, the Bitcoin API. This is, a, this is Grafana, but it's just powered by QuestDB. Or if you want, uh, like, you know, this is an open data set with New York City taxi rides, and we are, every second we are getting a new, like, you know, new data. So that's basically the kind, the kind of uh, scenarios we power. People with real time or analytics over time, data sets, and that's kind of the idea. And I'm going to show you what I mean by replication. So by replication, I mean this. 
I didn't connect, so hopefully, let me do this before. So I have to SSH into my EC2 cluster, okay? I'm going to start. So what I'm doing here, I have three machines on AWS. I have a primary and I have two replicas. So let me just, I should have done this before the talk actually. So what I'm doing now, I'm just starting some, uh, some infrastructure. I will tell you now what I'm doing. So I'm just, uh, okay. Just give me one second, and I will tell you what's going on in the screen. I cannot type and speak at the same time, like, you know, can do one thing or the other, but both are tricky for me. Okay. So basically, what I just did, I have uh, three machines on AWS. One is in Ireland. The other is, the, re the first replica is also in Ireland, and I have yet another replica in Stockholm. And I just started, the primary and the first replica. The other I didn't start, so I only started the primary and one of the first replicas. And I started some, uh, some um, Docker Compose, a Kafka and something to start sending data. So this is my primary machine. I'm going to log in with the default user and password, very secure. So I have a table. I've been getting data from the hotel room. I have a, a very small table. I have only not even 8 million rows, okay? This is not about size, so not even 8 million rows here. I have the first replica, and it has the same amount of rows. Uh, you know, almost 8 million rows. And I have the second replica. I cannot refresh because right now it's, it's a stop. But basically, last time I checked, it had also the same number of rows, which makes sense. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start sending data to my uh, primary. Let me just SSH for a second here. And um, CD, ingestion, Python, okay. And cool. so I'm, I, I'm going to start sending some uh, data. To, actually, that's quite slow. I'm going to send data a bit faster. Oh yeah, that's, that's okay. So I'm sending data now to my primary machine. I'm sending data here, so now you can see, every time I refresh, I should see I have more rows, eight millions and a half. If I check how many events per second I'm getting, I'm getting about 42,000 events per second, which is not much, it's just for a demo. So if I go to the first replica, I should see now the number is also, the number of rows is also growing. So yeah, as you can see now, it's catching up with the primary. The second replica, which was a stop, if I start the second machine, which will be here, I connect, I start the server, and the first thing the server will do, it will be catching up with the primary, which will see a lot of logs when the machine starts. It's like, yeah, it's doing things. It's just writing all the data from the primary, and eventually this is the replica in Stockholm. And yeah, it already has the same number of rows as the primary, so things are working as you would expect. And this is what I mean by replication, okay? This is what I'm going to be, how we build this, how we build the thing for having a machine just in data, the other machines catching up with the primary. That's, that's the idea. So that's basically what I want to explain today. I already spent a lot of time on the explanation because I forgot to start the servers, but that's fine. So a year ago, I was not in the same stage because it was in Malaga. I was not wearing the swimsuit, suit, but uh, yeah, I, I was speaking how you can ingest over four million rows per second on a single instance. And that was the problem. At the time, if you wanted to scale QuestDB, you would have to scale vertically. You could add CPUs or memory, but we wouldn't have replication. It would be a single machine. We could still serve some interesting use cases, but you couldn't scale out. And you want to scale out, not only because, you know, you want to scale out in number of requests, but also because the internet production is a scary place. Hardware is going to go, to go down, your disks are going to be filling, your uh, network is not going to be reliable, devices will run out of battery, they will restart, they will break. The protocols, maybe sometimes they try to send something, if they don't get a, a response, the buffer is going to fill, it's going to be some like, you know, problems out there. You are going to end up losing data or having some, you know, having some uh, unhappy users if you have a single machine. And that was something that we were listening. We, we were hearing from a lot of users. 
you have to have replication if you want me to use QuestDB. I was like, okay, so we should implement replication. We are going to do that. So this is QuestDB, high-level architecture of our database. Uh, you can read data in different ways uh, with, you know, with a Postgres wire protocol, a RSQL API. I don't care about reading right now. I care about ingesting data. For ingesting data, you can ingest data using a specialized protocol. It's called ILP. Uh, it's an influx. InfluxDB is another time series database. So they created the ILP protocol. It's quite fast for time series, and we use that one for ingesting fast data. But you can, you can also ingest data sending uh, CSV over REST or just PG wire protocol, Postgres compatible library, and just send data, we write to the API. So we replicated this part. Replication is about how we make data that is written to a primary to be available on the replicas. That's basically the idea. Uh, in QuestDB, we are only about time series. So our storage layer is a bit specific. First thing, we only do well time series. We don't do well any other use case. So since users are going to be querying data very likely over a continuous slice of time, we sort the data physically in the disk by timestamp. So we don't need any indexes. We always do full scan. We just, you know, we position ourselves at the starting uh, timestamp, and then we read sequentially, and everybody's happy. If you are reading sequentially, the CPU, the disk drive, everybody's super happy about sequential read. So we, we do full scans all the time. We have some specialized secondary indexes for a specific data type, but we, we usually we don't, we don't use them. Data is also partitioned by timestamp. You can choose by hour, by week, by month, by year, whatever. But basically, when you have a query, we go only to the partitions that are including your query. We position ourselves at the starting timestamp, and then we read sequentially, and we have the data in columnar format. So we only have to read sequentially the columns that are in the query, not all the data. So that's like you know, the fastest, totally fastest way of reading, of reading data. And since the use cases we power are about that, that's, that's good for us. Uh, when you are working with time series, it's important to be, to be performant, but it's more important to be predictable. So it's not about being fast, it's about being always as fast or as slow. But I know if with this machine, I can ingest, I don't know, 10 events per second, 10,000 events per second, 2 billion events per second. I can do it all the time. And I don't care if someone is running a lot of queries in the same server. Even if the queries are slow, my ingestion never stops. It's important I never lose the data. So we are also about predictable ingestion rate, and, and we have some mechanisms to make sure that a slow reads are not affecting a slow writes, and that, that, you know, that kind of idea. So that's quite important for us. Ah, yeah, we also support updates, whatever. So when it comes to the storage layer, this was also before, uh, before we started replication, and it's also the case today. What we do is like, for each table and each partition, we have a folder, and in that folder, we have one file, a binary file per column. If the column is a fixed type, a fixed length, sorry, like an integer or a byte or whatever, we only have one file. And you know, if you have to read the row number 100, and you have bytes, you know you have to go to the 800th position. That's quite easy. If you have a variable size uh, column, like a bar chart or whatever, then we store two files per column, one for the binary data and one for the offsets. So we can know where you ha we have to skip and so on and so forth. So if you take a look at any QuestDB, uh, for example, my local instance in QuestDB, where I have it here, I believe, yeah. So this will be, for one of my tables, this will be my structure. I have only one partition. I have data only for one day. And then inside, I have one column, one file with binary data per column. And then I have some metadata and some whatever, like function sequence, whatnot. But that's basically the, the, the idea. Uh, let me try and go back to my slides. Here they are. OK. Uh, as I told you, the data needs to be, ingested, needs to be stored sequentially. So if I get data, like here I have some data from two different uh, hours, and the, it's not sorted. Some data you can see is not coming in order. So eventually, when we write the data, the data from one hour, it will be in one partition. Data from another hour will be in another partition, and data will be sorted. That's, no, that's, basically, that's basically it. And one interesting thing, when you are working with a fast database, and I told you data needs to be always in, uh, sorted by timestamp, what happens when data is coming out of order? My data is, has to be like, no, 
in the first version of QuestDB, we were not accepting the data. If you were sending me data that was older than data that already had in the table, it's like, oh, I cannot write this. You know, fuck you. That's it. And, and people were like, I don't like it, but no, it's fast, so I will use it. That's fine. Eventually, it was like, yeah, you know, we have to do better. So, so what we do now, if you have data which is coming out of order, or you have updates, that we also support updates and upsets and so on, basically, we need to update the data in the file system. So what we do is, uh, if data is coming out of order, we take the file we already have, we find where we need to insert the data, we split the data in two, we create a new file with the rows that we have to put in between, and then you can already query sequentially again from those files, and eventually, a background process will compact that. To not slow down the database, what we are doing really, we create a snapshot of the partition. So basically, we version the partition. You didn't notice, because I didn't show you, but here, in this uh, tree here, after the partition, I have number 11. That number 11 means the version. If I go to my local database, which is somewhere like here, and I do like any insert update operation, and I go back to my file system, and I ask again, I will see now number 11 is now number 12. So basically, every time there is a rewrite of the data, I, I just overwritten a whole partition. So every time there is a rewrite, we version the partition in a separate folder. We sort the data in that new partition. When the data is ready, we check that there are not any queries using that partition. And once we detect that there are no queries using that partition, we just swap and rename and delete and whatever. So that's how we deal with updates. So we are kind of immutable, but not really. So that, that's how we do the trick of having always the index uh, in time and so on and so forth. You might have noticed now I have a, lo a lot more uh, files here. That's because of replication, which is the thing I want to talk about next. So first I wanted to tell you in general what's our, our model. And yeah, we have some challenge with locking, but I don't have much time for that. But in the past, we have some challenge with locking. We also wanted to avoid any locking. If you have like multiple connections using Postgres in the same table, they could have locking issues. We don't have that anymore. So we decided to do replication. And the first thing is like, which flavor of replication? You can do synchronous or asynchronous. We are designed for fast ingestion, fast data. Uh, we are not usually the source of truth. So we went with asynchronous because, you know, we prioritize speed. Uh, you could have single, uh, just a primary and multiple replicas, grid replicas, or multi-primary. So we decided to start only with grid replication, but eventually having multi-primary. So you can write to different machine. So that's basically, we started with only one, now we have both of them. Then you can choose how to do coordination. The moment you have to replicate, we have just one talk about Raft. Coordination is hard. You can choose to do it like Cassandra, like peer-to-peer -peer with different mechanisms or with a coordinator. In our case, we have a sequencer, a coordinator, that assigns transactions like this and so on. I will tell you about that. You can choose to replicate everything. So every replica has the whole data set or replicate only parts of the data. So in our case, we're replicating everything because in the next step that we still don't have, we are going to separate the storage from computation. So there will, there will be no need to grow, like, you know, to grow data in uh, the disk in one, in one single instance. But you can choose to do one or the other. And you can choose if you want to do replication with a gradual headlock or with, a, with another mechanism, like hinted handoff or something like that. Who here is familiar with uh, the gradual headlock? OK. Most of, most of you are familiar. I, I know, I know. I know most of you are familiar. But if I ask the other way around, no one is, no, is raising the hand. So just in case you're not familiar, write a headlock, a wall, is a very simple concept. Instead of writing data directly to the binary columns, every change I do to the database, a change can be an insert, a delete, change in permissions, create new table, whatever. So every time there is a change to the database, I register that in a, in a, in a sequence log, just in a log. So I have all the operations one after the other. And after I have that lock, I apply that to the actual storage where the data lives. So that helps me not only with replication, also with disaster recovery. If the machine goes down, mid transaction, when I start, I can clean up or whatever. But the thing is, when you do replication with a wall, with a, lock, with a wall it's quite simple to do replication because if you send the same sequence of steps, of changes, to three, four different machines, eventually, 
they are, they are all going to be in the same final state. So that's how you do replication. You create a list of changes, you apply it in different machines. Of course, the details are more complicated, but the concept is simple enough. Register everything, reapplying all the machines, eventual consistency, we are all happy. So we wanted to, uh, Postgres, for example, do that. They do like, you know, they have a, a water head lock in which the primary is sending the, the wall file to its replica, and the primary coordinates which replicas uh, have the, the data, which are, don't have the data, and so on. In ClickHouse, they have something different. They have, an inter they have like a coordinator. They have something they call the, the, the ClickHouse Keeper, which is compatible with ZooKeeper. So every time there is a change uh, on any primary, they send, the they send the notification of the change to the ClickHouse Keeper. The ClickHouse Keeper notifies the replicas. The replicas ask data from the primary. They get data from the primary, and they apply the changes. And we did something a bit more similar to ClickHouse than to Postgres. But this is just to tell you that these kind of operations are like quite common in databases. So we are not reinventing the wheel in QuestDB. We are just changing a few things, but we are doing things that are like, you know, already, already proven. And basically what we are doing is we have multi-primary replication with a greater headlock, which is going to be parallel. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's faster. We have a sequencer that we created for uh, coordination. In our case, the nodes don't need to see each other. In Postgres, the primary needs to see every node. In ClickHouse, every replica needs to see the primaries because they need to fetch the data. In our case, we don't need visibility across the nodes because we share the data across, uh, with, with set storage. So basically, we notify the sequence, or the sequencer gives me a transaction number. We send the write ahead log uh, to the sequence, uh, to, the, to the set storage, and the replicas check on the storage, and whenever they have new data, they just apply the, the, the changes locally. That's, that's, the, that's the idea, okay? So I, I, I'm skipping some details because you know, I'm mindful of time. Oh, I still have eight minutes, so I should be okay, but I have a lot of details. This is schematics that totally you don't see there because you know, it's just to tell you what I just say. That in QuestDB, you have like multiple primaries. The primary tells the sequencer, give me a transaction number. They create the water log. They send it to the set storage. The replicas and the other primaries check the uh, set storage. It can be S3, it can be acid block storage, it can be HDFS, it can be uh, NFS. They check the set storage, they apply the data, eventually they are all happy. So the first thing we did is doing a parallel wall because we don't, we don't have to, we didn't have to, we didn't want, sorry, to have locking issues with the same file. So for this different connection, you are writing to a different wall file. So you have three connections, we'll have a subdirectory with wall zero, wall one, wall two. Each, each uh, directory will be keeping there the changes. We need to make sure the changes are applied in a sequence across different connections. So we have a component we call the sequencer. This is a local component, and then when you have multi-primary, it's also in remote. But the sequencer is just giving you transaction ID. So no matter which connection, no matter in which connection I am, I, know I can always serialize the, uh, you know, I can always serialize the information. And this happens across all the protocols. If I'm using Postgres or the RESTful protocol or ILP, each connection will have a different world ahead lock. They, they will all have the sequences. And eventually, we have a process that applies the changes. At this point, all the changes in the parallel logs are going to be applied in the sequence that, you know, that the sequencer was giving us. So all the changes are going to be applied in order. And uh, at this point also, we do the, du the duplication. So if you have the duplication configured in your table, you never get duplicated data. It's not that we get duplicates and then we remove. We never apply changes in the, in the binary storage that are duplicates. And that's how we do, uh, how do we think the sequencer tells me which is the next sequence, and that works. So basically, if I have three different connections, first transaction comes from the first connection, second also from the first connection, the third is coming from the second connection, the fourth is coming from wherever, but the sequencer is going to apply in order. So we know exactly what happened when, thanks to the transaction number from the sequencer. It all works, it also works, things work, and we are happy. So when I tell you about the changes, the, the changes we have in the wall file, changes can be many different things. In our case, the changes can be data and just inserting rows. It can be a SQL. SQL is when you are doing a create data or alter table, at column, drop partition, uh, change permissions, 
So SQL will be anything which is like a DDL. Uh, then we have some specialized types, symbols, and we have bind variable for statements. And then we have the commit record. So basically you can have several rows and a commit. So the whole file will register different types of data depending on type of record. This will be a logical representation. If I have a table, for example, with two columns of type symbol, uh, what? Okay, we are back, it seems. A column price, another column amount, whatever. This could be like different records. I can have a record of type mapping of symbols, which is like, you know, these two numbers here. I have, since I, I insert in data for two different symbols, symbols are like enumerate types. I have two symbol entry here. Then I have the, the, uh, the data itself. So as you can see here, a world record is not just, you know, data, it's data and metadata and some other things you might need. And eventually this is persisted into the disk in a different uh, structure. I saw you actually before. Here, when I was ingesting data, I saw you the partition data. And also, you saw here we have like a wall uh, with an ID. And here we have some data, some, some uh, columns and so on. So basically, what we are doing here is this. What we are seeing here is like, for each connection, I'm going to have a wall, one, zero, two, whatever file. Inside that, I have a transaction sequence, which allows me to tell me in which sequence the events for this connection happen. Then I have the, uh, the event file, which is just an index to know in which different column folder I have the things. Then I have a meta file, which tells me any changes I have on the schema. I have a schema version, any changes I have in the schema, I can see on this file. Then we have a, a file per column. We are changing that now. We are going to have a single file per row, but as, as of today, we still have a file per column. So basically, the one that log is very similar to what we have on the binary folder, just with the transaction metadata to know how to apply in order. And then we have a special file, the CV, which is commit verification, to make sure which transaction were already committed, which were not, if the machine goes down uh, in an uncontrolled manner, we can recover and know exactly what happened, so we can reapply changes and whatnot with that file. So if everything, a lot of information here, only to tell you that in the, no, in, in the case there are no conflicts, everything work. I send different commands, create table, insert data, commit, insert data, commit, alter table. As long as I don't have, I don't have conflicting changes, I can have two parallel world files and everything works. Here, I do an alter table and I receive back, uh, until here I have a structure version zero. Here I have a structure version one because I did an alter table, so I change the structure of one table, okay? And in the next step, I have another alter table. So basically what I'm trying to represent here is like, I send you from one connection alter table and send you another alter table from a different connection before I had notice of the other. That would be a conflict. So basically the sequencer tells me, hey, you cannot, you get an error, you have a stale schema, you are sending me the older version with changes, but I'm already in version one. So you get an error, you have to retry. This is the optimistic locking that a lot of people are doing. So we are doing optimistic locking to make sure that we can, we don't have locking, but we still have some error control. So we, on the client, you have to deal with that. You get an error, you have to retry. You know, something happened here. And replicating this is basically copying this to the cloud or to whichever you have the cloud, your search system, whatever. But once you have the world files locally, you only have to move them to S3 or to NFS or to HDFS or to whatever. And then we, we send those in compressed uh, form. and We have a, an index to control versioning and so on. But basically, the same thing that works for applying changes locally in one instance, it works for applying changes in multiple instances. That's, that's the idea. We have to deal with upgrades because we can have the primary in one version of QuestDB, the replica in a different version. Maybe we change some metadata. Maybe we add a new data type. That happens all the time. We add new data types. And, and the replica is still on the old version. The primary is in the new version. I send you a world record with a type that you don't recognize. What to do? You know, that, that's tricky. So we have an index on the share storage, which tells me in which version of the, uh, of, of the replication you are. It tells me which tables you have, in which uh, version of the table each of those tables are. 
which is your last transaction ID. So you know how you can recover from those changes, basically. That's kind of the idea. You can always recover from things like version upgrade and so on. So you have the index, and you know if you are compatible, if you are not compatible. So in QuestDB, the safe way to upgrade is you first update, you first upgrade any brief replicas, then you upgrade the primary, so the replica never gets a message that they don't understand. If they don't understand, they will respond. It's like, I cannot update. I, I, I cannot understand this. You have to agree to whatever. But you get the idea, yeah? If you, if you get a message from a new version, the replica knows it's from a new version, and they cannot understand. They have to, to cancel. But with that, you can do it. Finishing quickly, for multi-primary ingestion, we built our own replicated sequencer. We are using FoundationDB, actually, as the backend for the sequencer source of truth. So the sequencer have metadata, have FoundationDB, to keep track of status and to keep track of metadata. So we use another database to keep track of our database, which is funny, but you know, it is the way it is. Foundation is very fast, it works pretty well. So we're using Foundation to be for that. The libraries know automatically if you add a new replica uh, or primary to the cluster. The client libraries, they know it exists and they can immediately start sending data or reading data from that machine. We, say, we use the same optimistic locking uh, you know, technique between primaries as we use within the same machine. And what's next is my last slide. What's next is we are going to change the storage. I told you about how we store today, binary data and so on. We are moving to Parquet eventually, hopefully in the next few months, because uh, we want first to separate storage from computation. We want to grow larger than one, a single disk. We already did that for historical data, but now we are going to do that also for recent data. So basically, everything you store in QuestDB, it will go to Parquet. So then you can also use a data lakehouse architecture. But still, there is some data you can query from QuestDB. It will be faster to query. And we can take advantage of compression and so on. So basically, we are going to integrate better with the uh, ecosystem. That's basically it. So I don't have any more time. You want to try QuestDB open source. It's available uh, just, you know, on GitHub. If you want to pay QuestDB for something, we have a cloud and an enterprise version, but I prefer the open source version, you know, so start with that, with open source. See if you like it. Uh, we are open source, yes, contribute, uh, favorite on, you know, put the stars on GitHub, whatever. And yeah, if you want to have more information about what we're doing with QuestDB, I will be tomorrow at the booth. So I don't know if we have like any time for questions. I, I, I went like super fast, but yeah, thank you.